Hey YouTubers, it's me, Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art. I'm going to continue reading this oral history uh, of, it's called The Oral History of Do Dr. Jo Do John W. Goffman, MD, PhD, conducted December 20th, 1994, United States Department of Energy. The title of the study is called Human Radiation Studies, Remembering the Early Years. Human Radiation Studies. Lab rats, that's what we are. So, we left off at the Manhattan Project. I'm going to take my glasses off so I can read better. Goffman. We proved we had four millionth of a gram, and by then things had moved along. The Manhattan Project had gotten started. Things even became easier at Berkeley with the Manhattan Project backing and the Army. If you needed something, they could even put a triple A priority on it and get it off the train some and get it off the train going somewhere else. Oh, I see, I get it. They could even put a triple A priority on it and get it off the train going somewhere else. So the work was enormously facilitated when the Manhattan Project people came to Berkeley. Gorley, who came in from the Manhattan Project? Monsters. Okay. Harold Fiddler, who was later with the Berkeley Rad or Radiation Lab, he was, I think, a major or colonel, and he was assigned to the Berkeley Project. Yeah, I got the thing plugged in. I got to know Harold. I got to know Harold then. Uh, I got a lot of help from them in various ways. One thing, for example, we wanted to know whether uranium-233, which we had just discovered, would be fissionable. Would it or would it not be like plutonium or like 235 uranium? We had a small neutron source made with a mixture of polonium and beryllium. It was weak. It was just not enough, so we decided we had to have about a gram of radium. That's a curie. That's dangerous to handle, by the way. We bought a gram of radium for $10,000 and mixed it with the beryllium that came, in, that came in a lead block to Berkeley. By then, Seaborg had gone to Chicago. But the vision of the effort under the Manhattan Project was Harold Uray at Columbia. Uray was going to try to work out the gaseous diffusion method of separating 235 uranium. Arthur Compton of Chicago was trying to figure out whether a reactor would run. That was, that was the Fermi project. Also, if, you, if a reactor did run, could you make enough plutonium? Guess we found that out. The third thing was Ernest Lawrence's electromagnetic separation at Berkeley. Although I got to know Ernest Lawrence very well later, I did not participate in the Ernest Lawrence project. I was working with Seaborg. When I finished the work on 233U, I became the fourth chemist in the world to work with the plutonium. Really, they say Seaborg and Macmillan were the first two. The guy who really did the only chemistry that was worth talking about before me, before I got in, was Arthur Wall. <clears throat> he was a graduate student one year ahead of me. He knew everything in the world there was to be known about plutonium, and he taught me, and I got started at the same time. At the same time, I was getting ready to, ready to measure whether uranium-233 was fissionable. The radium and beryllium source, which is a strong neutron source, arrived. I had to be able to move that radium source up to a fission chamber and also test it with paraffins surrounding the fission chamber and without the paraffins slowing neutrons down versus the high-speed neutrons being made in the reaction between the radium, alpha particles, and beryllium. I don't know if any of you guys understand that, but... I didn't. <laughs> okay, I hope there's some science people out there listening, so maybe you can put in the comments, like, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> uh, 
the paraffin surrounding the chamber. Okay, I'll move on. I was having the shop make me a lead train to move my source up to the fission chamber because it was too dangerous to handle by hand. The shop had a lot of priority jobs and they couldn't do it all at once. Seaboard came back from Chicago having gone there to head the plutonium section of the Meteorological Laboratory Manhattan Project in Chicago. I stayed behind in Berkeley and he said, how are the fisherman, fission measurements going? I said, I haven't done them yet. And he said, you haven't done them yet? With a war going on, you haven't done the fission measurements? I said, Glenn, I haven't done them for a very distinct reason. The lead train isn't finished. He said, don't worry about that. Let me show you how to handle it. He went over to the old chemistry building that was torn down later. We went over to where I had the lead block with my gram of radium. He got a stick and tied a string to it. Just hold it out there and put it in front of the fission chamber and then put it back. He was there for five minutes, but I was going to do that every day to take measurements. That's probably where I got a major share of what dose of radiation I received from that operation. Wow. A gram of radium is a rotogen per hour at one meter. When you handle things at a small fraction of the meter, dose goes up as the inverse square of the distance. So I got a good appreciable dose. But we succeeded and we proved that uranium-233 was fissionable with slow and fast neutrons. Therefore, it was one of the three materials in the world that you think of about making, that you think of making bombs out of. Although you can only get to it by having thorium or a mixture of thorium and uranium irradiated in a reactor. A lot of it has been made since and bombs have been made out of it too. Since I was all set up for the fission measurements, I measured uranium-235 and plutonium-2. An interesting thing happened when I made these measurements. Professor Oppenheimer wanted to see the measurements. Gorley, now where is Professor Oppenheimer? Goffman, Berkeley, Gorley, was he there also? Goffman, yes before Alam Los Alamos. Professor Oppenheimer was looking at the measurements for calculations. I looked at Oppenheimer's equations and I said, isn't there a factor of 10 to the sixth that is wrong here? He looked at it and said, yeah, it doesn't matter. He was a remarkable guy. Yeah, Mr. Murder, Mr. Remarkable Guy. This is where the cussing starts for me. So what happened what, what happened was that Seaborg had gone off to Chicago and I completed the uranium-233 work. There was one episode before Seaborg left that was very interesting. Graduate students were rather playful. Seaborg's lab where I worked was on the third floor of Gilman Hall on the Berkeley campus. As I told you, Dean Lewis had been the father of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics always used big water baths to control temperature of their vessels and operated at a certain fixed temperature. But that era was all over in Berkeley. There were big baths out in the halls. In fact, one on top of the other on the third floor of Gilman Hall. I don't know what got into us, but Wall, Spofford English, Bob Duffield, and I were working one Friday night before Seaborg had left for Chicago. We decided we'd stack those bathtubs in Seaborg's office, which is where we were working, which is where we were working on our counters and things. I don't know why it never occurred to us. We were there the next morning, Saturday morning working, Art Wall, Spofford English, and I. 
the door opened, and there is Seaberg with a visitor. And who was this visitor? It was Harold Urey, who headed the New York operation of gaseous diffusion research. Seaborg, without cracking a smile or anything, stepped into the bathtubs because he couldn't do anything other than that. There was no room left. Urey stood in, stood in another one. Now these are some famous people. And there was a famous mental exchange. Ure said, Glenn, I think I ought to give up this plutonium project. And Seberg said, why would you say that? Here we, ha here we are, just completely crushed. What a mess we made. And Seberg and Hel Ure standing in the bathtubs in room 203 of Gilman Hall. Ure said, look, I don't know how long the war will last. And I don't see any possibility that you can learn how to isolate plutonium from that mess. We have made a fission project, products and uranium in time for the war effort. So he said, I think we ought to give it up and just focus on uranium-235, for which Ernest Lawrence had one project and he had the other. Fermi's, reactant, Fermi's reactor had already run, so it was assured you could make the plutonium. Seaborg was uncanny in one feature. He had an uncanny knack for being able to see ahead what would be important and what might not be important. He said to Ure, Oh, that's no problem, Professor Ure. We worked out all the techniques. We worked all the techniques out for separating plutonium once it's made. There we were sitting. Remember, Wall was the only guy in the world who'd worked with plutonium, and I was the second one, besides Seaborg and Macmillan. We knew damn well what we didn't know. Here he's telling Ure, we have all the techniques worked out. It was the furthest thing from the truth, but I guess he figured we'd work it out. Wow. So from the very beginning, they've done nothing but lie. It's so incredible. Then they left. We cleared the room and he never said a word about those bathtubs being put in his room. One of the most famous conversations in the whole war in that room with Harold U. Ray suggesting we stop the plutonium project. Well, we didn't stop the plutonium project as you know. Orly, right. I'm at 12 minutes. I think I want to keep going because we got to get through this. We're at a new section called From Research to Laboratory Production of Plutonium. Goffman. Art Wall taught me everything he'd learned about plutonium and I went on working on plutonium chemistry. By the way, just as an aside, everything was compartmentalized. Hmm. Nothing's changed, I can see. The security division of the Manhattan Project came to see me and said, you're not working on uranium-233 anymore. You're working on plutonium. I said, that's true. They said, then don't you have a need to know what's in your own notebooks? Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm going to read that again. They said, then you don't have a need to know what's in your own notebooks. I had to give up my notebooks that I'd done on the Uranium-233 work. I got them back after the war. These people are evil. I swear to God, they are so freaking evil. I did work on chemistry of plutonium. The whole thrust was to learn enough about the chemistry of plutonium toward being able to separate it when Hanford's separation facility would be built. So we worked on a test tube level to try to do the separations. We thought that plutonium in the higher oxida oxidation state would behave like uranium. There was a compound we knew about called sodium uranial, uranyl acetate. That's uranium in the plus six oxidation state. The plutonium might behave that way. I tested it. And it did behave that way. 
If you precipitated sodium uranyl acetate, even if you had just a limited number of atoms of plutonium, the plutonium went with sodium uranyl acetate. Based on that one thing, I worked out a process that would isolate plutonium away from uranium in one step and then get it to go back with uranium. I could cycle it back and forth to get rid of the fission products by having two different oxidation states of plutonium. On a lab bench basis with little beakers, it all worked fine, and the plutonium came through the process. I wrote it up, and as a result of my work, there was one possible way for a separation facility at Hanford. We had an occasion to use it. Oppenheimer decided with Manhattan Engineer District Commander General Leslie R. Groves and the military to step up the Los Alamos lab. He invited all of us at, the Berk at Berkeley to go with him. Joe Kennedy, as I said, became his head chemist. We knew Joe. I elected to stay in Berkeley because they were so unsure about security that anybody that went to Los Alamos went with the understanding that it's for the rest of the war. You would have no communication with the outside. Oppenheimer said that to me. You could not even telephone or write. They had to back off of that idea quite a lot. They were very worried about security. I decided to stay in Berkeley. Oppenheimer went down to Los Alamos and about two months later, this was late 1942 or early 1943, he contacted me with a note that said he wanted to see me. By then the facility member who was responsible for our group Bob Connick and I were the group leaders, was Wendell Latimer, who was a superb chemist, an excellent chemist with just the right kind of experience to work with the inorganic chemistry of elements like plutonium. Oppenheimer said he wanted to see Professor Latimer and me. He and Joe Kennedy came to Berkeley and we met in Professor Latimer's office. Oppenheimer said, we need a half a gram of plutonium. I said, you're going to have grams of it in a half a year to a year from Oak Ridge. He said, yes, I know. We're going to have grams of it, but right now we need half a milligram, and there's only a twentieth of a milligram in existence. I said, why are you telling us that? He responded, because Joe says you make it. I said, he does? What do you mean? We have to bombard uranium on the Berkeley cyclotron to make it, depending on reactor availability. Professor Oppenheimer said, yes, I know. It would take a lot, maybe a ton of uranium. My chemists have told me so. Gorley interrupts him and says, so a ton of uranium to make Goffman. Uranium nitrate? Gorley. Oh, uranium nitrate. Goffman. Uranium nitrate to try to make a half milligram of plutonium. Well, I said, well, we will have to bombard it for six to seven weeks. He said, yes, I know that. I've already cleared that with the Ernest Lawrence. Then there's the other part of it, I told him. I haven't the vaguest idea whether this process that I've worked out in test tubes and beakers, scaling right up to the pounds at the time, will work. All things don't work well when you try to scale them up from the lab bench to the manufacture operations. He said, well, Joe thinks you can do it. Joe is sitting here, is sitting there. I'm thinking, thanks a lot. Well, we got a ton of uranium nitrate stacked around the Berkeley cyclotron to capture every neutron that was escaping. Bombarded it for about six to seven weeks. Let it cool a little. I should have let it cool for months, but we didn't. Then in room 110, Gilman Hall, we set up big jars and handled 10 pounds of the uranium at a time. With each jar, 
We took it to the first steps of our process and then the second step. After about three weeks of around the clock work, we had it down about a quarter teaspoon of liquid with plutonium in it and nothing else. We had 1.2 milligrams and we just needed a half a milligram. Joe Kennedy and Oppenheimer came back up. The first thing Oppenheimer said is, how much did you get? I said we needed a half a milligram. Oppenheimer insisted, come on John, I want to know how much did you get? I answered, you got a milligram and two tenths. He said, well, what's he saying? Well, 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 got to turn the page. Well, we'll take a milligram and you can keep the two tenths to play with it for chemistry. And that's what we did. Oh, I'm at 20 minutes. I'm going to stop here. I, I, I think it gets too boring if I read for too long. So let me mark the page so I do not lose my place the next time we come here. So thanks for uh, listening to this. This is really being read for um, posterity, really, so that people don't forget about this. Um, and if people understand the science of some of this stuff, maybe you can make comments and let us know. So <laughs> put your courage feet on, you guys. Take action. Follow your heart. And actually... Um, I think we need to start praying a whole lot. Like, prayer is really the answer. I, I'm really beginning to get these messages that we need to, like, walk in love and pray and believe in our higher selves, our higher power, and uh, meditate or however you want to call it. I call it prayer, talking to God. And uh, times are critical, which is why I'm doing these videos. So talk to you guys later. Well, I'll make a reading tomorrow night. And... Um, the radio show is going to be interesting tomorrow. We're going to, I'm going to be talking with Weeping Willow, too, about uh, not living in fear. And uh, I'm very excited. We have some really good interviews coming up, and uh, we'll talk with you later. Ciao.